ready to rock today, Fire Nation. JLD here, and welcome to an audio masterclass that is going to flip your magic switch on your innate brilliance. And that is the title, How to Flip on the Magic Switch of Your Innate Brilliance. And this is a value bomb-packed masterclass with Arjuna Arder. This guy is so cool. I really enjoy chatting with him. And we're going to be talking about what brings happiness? What brings deep fulfillment? What is that magic switch? And they're going to talk about the brilliance cycle in Fire Nation. You need to get your mind wrapped around this brilliance cycle because, wow, it was a doozy. Now, who is Arjuna Arder? Well, he is an executive coach, writer, and public speaker, and he's spoken at conferences all over the world, including at the United Nations and at Google, and he's trained more than 2,000 people as coaches and has been coaching for more than 25 years. His clients include CEOs, members of Congress, Hollywood writers, and filmmakers social innovators, and disruptive entrepreneurs. He's the author of nine books, including the number one national bestseller, The Translucent Revolution. And his latest book, Radical Brilliance, is a complete manual on how to have original ideas which change the world. So Fire Nation, we're going to dive into all this amazing content when we get back from thanking our sponsor. In business, there are smart moves and not so smart moves, like getting bogged down with hundreds of resumes from candidates who aren't the right fit. That's not smart. Luckily, there's a smart way to hire at ZipRecruiter because its powerful technology scans thousands of resumes to identify people with the right skills and experience and then actively invites them to apply to your job. That means you get quality candidates fast. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash fire. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash fire. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. So Otter Juna, say what's up to Fire Nation and share something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. All right. Well, what's up? What's up, Fire Nation? <laughs> you know, the, uh, I think the thing that most people don't know about me is the people who do know about me, they know that I've written nine books. One of them was a national bestseller. They know that I've spoken at Google, United Nations. I know all that stuff. What a lot of people don't know about me is my greatest accomplishment, in my opinion, the thing I'm most proud of is being a father and the way things have panned out for my two boys. And actually just being able to do that at all. I was so unconfident about being a parent And I think when I die one day, it will be the parenting that I will take with me as the crowning achievement of my life more than any of the other stuff. Wow. Love that. Inspiring. So Fire Nation, obviously, we're going to be dropping some value bombs on this episode. This is an audio masterclass on how to flip on the magic switch of your innate brilliance. And I can tell you, this book, Radical Brilliance, has already helped me in the portions that I read of it flip on some really brilliance that I was just like, wow, I did not even know that was there waiting for this little flip to be switched. So we have a lot of cool things we're we'll talking about. I want to dive in because, man, we have a very passionate man on the other side of the mic. He can really match my energy, which I love. So let's just start off by saying, yeah! what is that magic switch? And how does it bring real and deep fulfillment? Okay. So great. You know, the quest for the magic switch is really innate to human beings. The thing that sets us apart from the other 2.3 million species on the earth is that we have this highly developed prefrontal cortex, right? So a lot of blood flow to the front part of the brain. Dolphins come a little close, penguins nowhere near. So we've got this very highly developed prefrontal cortex. What does that allow us to do? It allows us, first of all, to dispassionately evaluate the condition of our life as it is right now. That means to be able to say, oh, my marriage is kind of so-so, it could be better. Yeah, my business is going well, but you know we could do better. So it allows you to evaluate your life as it is right now and see how it's doing. The other thing that the prefrontal cortex allows you to do is to imagine, to visualize, to experience something that's not yet here. It allows you to experience potential. And when you get those two things going on, the capacity to experience things as they are right now and the capacity to imagine potential either through role models or visualization, that dynamic tension between those two is called evolution, whether it's personal evolution or collective evolution. When you've got a tension between what is and what could be, that difference 
is evolution. And that's what spawned the whole self-improvement industry and, you know, people working on themselves and personal development. Now, there's a lot, I'm going to speak really fast here, but there's a lot of different answers people have to what will bridge that gap. For a lot, a lot of people, it's been money. You know, if you go back to the 80s and the 90s, everybody believed, not everybody, but the, the vast majority, the culture was set on it. The more money you make, the more you're going to bridge that gap. By now, there's been a host of sociological research to prove that's simply not true. If you look at the Center for Positive Psychology, if you look at the book Affluenza written by the psychologist uh, Oliver James, there's a whole host of research to show that very, very wealthy people are on average slightly less happy than moderately wealthy people. Moderately wealthy people are indeed happier than poor people, but there's no evidence to show that making loads of money is actually going to bridge the gap. Then we could switch it over to, okay, relationship, find your soulmate. A lot of people pin their hopes on that. Well, that mostly gets dashed to the ground as well once a relationship goes through the honeymoon phase. We could keep going. Perfect health, longevity, et cetera, et cetera. And the final big kahuna for many people is spirituality, you know, become enlightened, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't seem to work out for too many people either. So, but now we can do a little reverse engineering, and this is a highly caffeinated version of the book, but, <laughs> uh, but now we can do a little reverse engineering and see, well, actually, there are incredibly fulfilled people in the world. There are people whose fulfillment is just peaking, you know, breaking the glass ceiling. And as a byproduct of that incredible fulfillment and gratitude and high energy, money flows easily, relationships are fun, they laugh a lot, everything's good. So now we can do some reverse engineering and find out what do those people have in common? Highly fulfilled people where everything's going well and they are making money, but they're not thinking about money, what is the key? And that is also, of course, the key to successful entrepreneurship. If we do reverse engineering, and I did a lot of this, I interviewed 420 brilliant people to find out what is the magic switch. If we condense it down, and if someone is listening to this podcast, I'd love to invite you to pause just for a second and come up with your own answer before I tell you. Okay, now unpause, and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, the answer, the conclusive answer from interviewing so many people is having a real sense of contribution to something bigger than yourself. When you can really feel that your life is being used in service to something bigger than your own fears and desires, and it's impacting more than just your own well-being, that's when things start to kick in. That's when money takes care of itself in the background. That's when good relationships and humor take care of themselves. That's where you have a lot of energy and you're in mostly good health. All of that is the byproduct of finding a sense of original contribution, real contribution. Now, you may be a Democrat or a Republican, doesn't matter, but something that brought the country together last week as we're recording this was the death of and the, and the funeral of, of John McCain. Right. And what you saw what everybody got up, we got, uh, you got Obama and George Bush, who were you know, very ideologically, very different people. What they both commented on was, this guy lived for something bigger than himself. He lived for values. He wasn't thinking about how, how much money can I get? How famous can I be? How can I you know, kiss the rear end of famous people? He was thinking about how can I contribute? How can I stay true to what's good and right and true? Those are our heroes. Those are the people we look up to as role models. And what I'd like to focus on in our conversation is how can every single person listening to this podcast become an inspiring example of brilliance, which means making the greatest contribution possible, not only to people today, but to the grandchildren of our grandchildren. Fire Nation, there's so much in there that I really want to pick apart. I mean, first off, the main course here is what brings happiness? I mean, is it relationships? Is it spiritual? Again, he went back to the 80s and 90s. It was money, but of course, that was not the answer. And can you actually really quickly, because this is one thing I found fascinating, talk about the income graph? I thought that was really interesting to hear those numbers. That's a graph that has been duplicated, and you can find that in Martin Seligman's work at the Center for Positive Psychology. It's, it's in the book, by the way. You can also find it duplicated in the book Affluenza, but there's lots of research done on this. As people have started to explore well-being, they discover if you're making, say, twenty five to 30000 a year, and your income goes up to 40000 according to 22 parameters of well-being, your well-being goes up. That would mean less likelihood of drug addiction, less likelihood of, of stress, uh, greater connection with your children, you know, less likelihood of divorce. All the, um, the parameters of well-being go up when your income increases 
you know, from say, you know, 30 to 40,000. There's a point where it levels off. In countries in Northern Europe where they have nationalized medicine, like in England, that point is slightly lower. So in England, it's about 72,000 pounds. In America, it's slightly higher because we have to pay for our own medicine and higher education and so on. But there's a point where it levels off. In other words, we can see that after a certain point, you can go on making more money, but your well-being doesn't actually get affected anymore. You have about the same level as well of well-being. So in other words, once your basic survival and you've got your vacations and you've got a house and you're able to pay your mortgage, and you've got a car, after that, it doesn't make so much difference. And if you've got three cars, getting a fourth makes no difference to well-being, right? But here's the shocking thing that after a certain point, like a bell curve, it actually starts to go down. So research has shown that if you're making two million a year and your income goes up to three, there's an increased chance of drug addiction, estrangement from children, divorce, stress. And this is why you may have seen this statistic, but many times when people win the lottery, they end up suing the lottery. Right. <laughs> they end up suing the people who issued the lottery ticket because their life was so ruined by earning all this money. So that's just an interesting statistic. But, you know, let's not get this wrong. If you are on fire to make a difference, if you want to make the world a better place for everybody, if you want to solve global warming or financial inequality, if you want to end racism, if you, if you want to do something amazing for the world, you're going to need a flow of income and you're going to need expenditure and you need to make sure that stays in the positive. So let's not knock money. I mean, money is a necessary lubricant for giving your gift, but as a goal on its own, it quickly becomes a key to frustration. Especially Fire Nation, when you have a clear sense of your real sense of contribution, like when you know what your contribution is, then money can add to you doing that and to add, can add to your contribution. Like I love that Dale Carnegie quote, it's something that's stuck with me for years now, and that's happiness is the gradual realization of a worthy ideal. And the key yeah. words there is, is gradual. It's not getting to the finish line. No, it's gradually yeah. realizing, and not just any ideal, but a worthy ideal. So Fire Nation, what's your real sense of contribution? That's a focus. And brilliance, I will always associate you with the word brilliance. So let's talk Thank about you. brilliance. Yeah. Let's talk about the factors that actually contribute to brilliance. And of course, your brilliant cycle. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I, I got, I had a car accident a couple of years ago, which laid me up and it caused a kind of pause button in my life. I was running a coaching school at that time. I trained more than 2000 coaches worldwide. So I was really busy. You know, I had a staff of 23 people, all these coaches. I was busy, busy, busy. And when I had this car accident, I, I didn't break any bones, but I was kind of frozen. You know, it was, it was, it was a high impact accident. I don't know why I was spared like this, but I didn't actually have any harm to my body, just that I went into a kind of post-traumatic state. You know, what do they call that? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, yeah. PTSD. Yeah. So, yeah, so I was frozen. And in that frozen state, these big questions started to come into my consciousness, like, you know, the meaning of life. What's the meaning of life? Why are we here? You know, and specifically, I just turned 60 at that time. Like, why am I here? What is my life about? And, and uh, am I heading in the right direction? And I realized that there was something, my life wasn't super off track, but there was something deeper. And then I started to actually contemplate, you know, for, for three months, I was just really in reclusion, getting over this car accident. I started to contemplate all the incredibly fulfilled people I know for whom success just happens on its own. I'm fortunate enough to be very good friends with John Gray, who wrote the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. We wrote a book together called Conscious Men. And he He's somebody, you know, you may agree or disagree with his ideas, doesn't matter, but he's somebody for whom success just happens very, very easily. My wife's an example. My friend Barat Mitra, who's, whose company went from nothing to 200 million in 20 years. You know, these are people whose success happens through relaxation more than striving. So, and there's a lot of examples. John Mackey, who founded Whole Foods, now he's sold it, of course, to Amazon. But there's just, I have an endless ex list of people who have found a way to effectively bring about change in the world, but not in the way that we think of through the kind of Protestant work ethic um, or the kind of post-industrial age work ethic where you, you, know, you, you work hard, you grind, you work for the machine. You know? So through some reverse engineering, I was able to recognize four 
very different components, which when they are all activated in anyone's life, become a brilliant life. And it's, it's, it's pretty predictable. It's like if you've got these four ingredients, like if you've got, you know, if you've got flour and eggs and milk and butter and a recipe, you will get a cake. It's pretty predictable you're going to cake. <laughs> may not be the best cake, but you will get a cake if you've got those four ingredients and a recipe, right? So these four ingredients, if they're all really switched on, they do lead to a life of brilliance. And I'm going to briefly explain them. So we can think, is that okay for you? Can I yeah, just go through? Yeah, let's rock yeah. it. Yeah, let's rock it. Yeah. So we could think of this something like a clock, you know, with 12 at the top, three on the right, six on the bottom, and uh, nine on the left. So first, I'm going to briefly label four stations on the clock, but this is not about stations. It's about movement. So I'll label four stations. So once we understand the stations, I'll explain the movement that goes between them. So at the top, at 12 o'clock, we've got what we can loosely call moments of awakening. That simply means moments, at least, where you transcend the limits of your mind and experience some kind of boundaryless consciousness. That could happen through a spiritual practice like meditation. It could happen through prayer. It could happen through, you know, skiing down a double black diamond slope. If you're a skier, it could happen through bungee jumping. It could happen through making love. It can happen in lots of ways. A moment where you get out of your mind and the kind of constraints of fear that the mind lives in and experience something boundaryless where the stress leaves your system. That's 12 o'clock. Three o'clock, we could call creative flow. That's where things are flowing through you easily. There's no restriction. You're just, yeah, you just, you, you don't have to do anything. It's like a musician jamming. You don't have to put effort into it. It's flowing through you or an artist up all night painting, but equally an entrepreneur, a business owner, who's just the, the, the ideas and the innovation is just happening on its own effortlessly. That's three o'clock. Six o'clock is about accomplishment. It's about achieving goals within time and financial restraints and, and uh, restraints of agreement. That's where you operate within boundaries of budget, of timelines, of contracts, and so on. That's, uh, that's about getting things done, which is a very different kind of brain activity again. And finally, we get around to nine o'clock, which is basically about humility and learning. So that's where you realize I'm not I'm not God's gift to everybody. So on the, it's the opposite of three. At three, you had boundaryless flow. At nine o'clock, you kind of, you feel, ah, oh, wait a minute, I've got a, I've got a bunch of flaws and things I don't understand. So you have humility. Now, those are four stations, but let me briefly go back through it and describe it as movements. Because when it's, when you describe a movement that it comes alive, and if you get the book or go to the website, you'll see that it's, 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 portrayed as four arrows which are birthed out of each other. So if we start at 12, at a moment of awakening, if you relax, if you are able to just relax into a, a stress-free, limitless state of the mind, and I'm sure anybody listening has got their own version of that, a, a, a state where the boundaries drop away, you feel emotionally, mentally free, you feel limitless, what happens there, if you just hang out without any grasping or repression, there is a kind of energy to that. It's naturally vibrating. It's vibrating on its own in a very fine way. If you can hover in that, and of course, a good way to do that is just close your eyes, you know, just close your eyes and hang out a while and you start to notice a natural energy. Some people feel it as pleasurable feelings in the body. Some people feel it as love, you know, but it's just a, it's a natural pleasant vibration, which is a quality of who you really are. If you just hang out with that and let it build in intensity, that's the movement from 12 to 3. The movement from subtle impulses that arise on their own, that build in intensity until they are moving through you at 3 o'clock. So that's the first movement from a subtle impulse to full-on creative flow. But that's how creative flow happens. It's effortless by following fine impulses. So that's the first movement, which in the, in the diagram is orange. So then a second movement from three to six starts with one particular kind of creative impulse, which we can call intention. Now, remember, three o'clock is all about creative impulse. Things are flowing on their own. So one particular kind of creative flow that happens for all of us is intention. Intention is like creativity now velcroed to a future 
idea or a future goal. That's an intention. And that's, of course, what, you know, the movie The Secret was all about, you know, the law of attraction. It's about setting intentions and realizing them. But the intention is set at three where you're in full creative flow. The next movement, which is blue on the diagram, goes from intention to accomplishment. And that's a completely different way of using your brain. Totally different brain chemicals involved. It involves getting things done. And the closer we get to six o'clock, the more we're using adrenaline in the body and neuroadrenaline in the brain to actually meet deadlines. It's a place where many people sometimes experience stress. In the first movement from 12 to three, there was no stress. As we move from three to six, we do start to experience the constraints of money time agreement. Once we get to six, now you've accomplished something. Now we get this kind of mysterious phenomenon of postpartum depression, which happens not only after having a baby, it also happens after any kind of achievement. You may have noticed this when you make a lot of money, when you get things done, you win the prize and you expect to feel great. And actually, you feel a little depleted. You feel a little like, ah, oh, you know, this happens for many people, many entrepreneurs who are very successful after reaching a milestone they actually feel a little depressed. And this is because of a phenomenon that happens right after six o'clock. It's the beginning of the next phase, which was coined as double bind by Gregory Bateson in the 20th century. He wrote a book called, called Towards an Ecology of Mind. And he discovered this phenomenon of double bind. Double bind means when you operate within limits, when you operate within the boundaries of time and space, you are inevitably forced to make choices. So let's take a very simple example of that, which I'm sure many people can relate to. Imagine you inherit a company, you buy a company, you inherit a company, and there are people who've been working that company for a long time. Maybe their parents even work there. So they, they think of the company like their family, but the company is outdated. So it needs modernization. It needs automation. You've also got other people who are involved with the company as investors, and that may also be family members. So now what do you do? Do you lay people off? to satisfy the shareholders? Or do you keep the people on to, to honor that kind of bond you have and that loyalty, but maybe disappoint the shareholders? That's just a very simple, perhaps superficial example of double bind. But it appears when you're locked in the double bind that you can't make everybody happy. And sometimes a double bind may be between your own needs and the needs of your body and the needs of other people. So if you push through to achieve a deadline at the expense of your own health, that's a double bind where you've now let your health suffer and maybe your family life suffer in order to get the job done. So double bind is inherent within accomplishment. You can't avoid it. It's not just if you have bad luck, it's everybody faces double bind. And therefore, there will inevitably, whether you've experienced success or failure, there will inevitably on the other side of six be some quality of regret, shame, failure, remorse, inadequacy. These are very unpopular feelings. You know, the, the self-help industry would like to help us to avoid these feelings completely, but they're actually our teachers. You know, if, you, if you're abrupt with somebody, if you cut somebody off, if you're really like, you know, hyper and, and just running on that kind of adrenaline and you're, you're harsh with somebody, probably you're going to feel it. You're going to feel like, ah, oh, oh, what did I just do? Ah. And if you stop and feel that, it's painful. You feel a little bit of shame. But as you move through that, it becomes learning and it moves on into humility. So when we get to nine o'clock, you have an essential ingredient of brilliant people is they know their limits. They know that there are things they that they are good at and there are lots of things they're not good at. They realize that there are things they know. There's lots of things they don't know. So that's a place of humility where you no longer think you're the king of the world. You realize well, I'm, I'm, I make a contribution, but I've sure got my flaws, you know, and I've had the privilege to interview people like, you know, John Mackey, who founded Whole Foods when he was still running Whole Foods. Very humble man. A lot of people who achieve great things in life actually have humility as part of their cycle. Now, if you hang out in humility, this is nine o'clock, you realize, you know, I sure need help. You know, I can't do much on my own. I've, I've certainly got a few good qualities, but boy, oh boy, I also mess up. That's when you intuit something bigger than your mind. You, at first, you have an intuition. This is now with a movement from nine to 12. You have an intuition of something bigger than your mind, but it's just an intuition. And that intuition fuels spiritual practice, which would be like meditation, but it also fuels the intuition of something like God or the divine, so that it could also fuel prayer, 
So either way, the movement from nine to 12 is more like what we're used to as mysticism or spiritual, the spiritual world where you move from realizing your own limitations as a human being and in having an intuition of something bigger, which you could call God, you could, could call it your true self or your higher self, you could call it universal collective intelligence, you might even think about little men on the moon or Pleiades or something, but <laughs> he, any which way you have an intuition of something bigger than yourself, you call in help from that and that moves you through until at 12 o'clock you merge with that bigger mind and you have another moment of awakening. That cycle that I've just described, 12, 3, 6 and 9, <clears throat> The four movements, when those four movements, movements are activated, brilliance becomes more of a predictable outcome than an occasional accident. Fire Nation, if your head is spinning a little bit, don't fear. It's exactly why you just need to get the book, Radical Brilliance. But don't make the same mistake that I made. I was actually sharing this earlier. I went for a run without a notepad. And there was like 15 aha moments I had while I was listening to the audio version of this, which by the way, Otter Juna reads himself, which is super cool, which I love. And I was just like, oh, I got to get back and I got to write down all these things that I'm having these breakthrough moments, these aha moments of. So Make sure you don't make that mistake. If you like listening to audiobooks, have a way to write down notes. Maybe it's your iPhone. Maybe it's just a notepad. I actually got this uh, really great notepad that it can get wet because it actually is like a shower pad. So it's really cool. So even when I'm sweating, it works perfectly. But you need something like that. And we need to be honest with our listeners right now because everybody is not being brilliant, original, and innovative all the time. Break that down for us. Why is this the case, Arjuna? That's a great question, John. And by the way, th uh, thanks for the great, thanks for the it's kind true. words. It's true. I was like, uh, no, I need to write something down. What? Uh, well, my, my response is, oh, shucks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And, you know, it's a funny thing because we're talking about how original great ideas arise, that they come, they come through the gaps in your mind, not from your mind. They come in these moments of stillness where you can actually step aside. And that's how this whole thing came to me. It's, I didn't write it. I'm just the messenger. You know, it, it, it came to me in a moment of stillness. I've got no idea where it came from. I don't have the email address of the author. But, <laughs> you know, but it's actually a lot of things are like that. Einstein describes it in the same way. Einstein doesn't take personal credit for the general theory of relativity. He was laying in the bathtub and his mind was a suitable vessel for that to take seed. But so many people, so many innovative, truly innovative, great people, including Steve Jobs, they say, you know, I can't take credit for me. It, it, for this, it came through me. I had also the great privilege when he was alive to get to know Leonard Cohen, who many people love, you know, as a tremendous uh, poet and musician and completely authentic and original. He couldn't take any personal credit for his work. He, he said it all just, he just step, steps aside and it comes from a, at least you could say it comes from a much deeper part of himself than the mind. But you, so what we can see, you know, when we look at this model is people are essentially brilliant. We are born brilliant. We are born connected with the source of brilliance. So children, they play, but you might better say they are played because there's not so much volition in it children are just played like a like a like a like a flute in the wind they're just played by the energy that gives us all life and you can also see it my wife went last uh, last year to the amazon and spent time with people deep 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 in the amazon people who only had their first contact with civilization a few decades ago and you can feel there's just this naturalness there's a way that that childhood innocence has not been lost but of course we get conditioned so it means really when i coach anybody or train anybody what you can see each and every time when we just dig a little bit deeper than the surface is people are inherently brilliant but the brilliance has most often, more often than not, been shut down by one of four kinds of blockage. And these four kinds of blockage exist in all four quadrants. So you've got four styles of blockage existing in four quadrants. In other words, 16 distinct ways that brilliance gets blocked. And those are, the number one is addiction. Addiction means that just like any addiction, you get addicted in your brain chemistry to wanting to stay exclusively in one of these four quadrants. That's addiction. 
The second kind of blockage is judgment, which is kind of the opposite, which is you develop a disdain or a dismissal of one part of the cycle. I think that's just idiotic. That's stupid. And therefore, you refuse to inhabit it. The third kind of blockage we call aspiration resistance, which has to do with craving and ambition and wanting something just slightly out of reach. So you can develop an aspiration re- an aspiration resistance habit in any of these four quadrants. And finally, we have looping. Looping means that you become an expert or you become a specialist in one tiny area of the cycle and you no longer inhabit the rest. So four kinds of blockage, addiction, and I'd be happy to give you examples of any of these in any of the four quadrants, but addiction, judgment, aspiration resistance, and looping, and all four styles of blockage exist in all four quadrants. So 16 distinct ways that our conditioning blocks the brilliance. If you can recognize what that is and apply the right practice to it, which we can talk about in a moment, you basically return to brilliance and you become you become as much of a vehicle of evolution as Einstein or Steve Jobs or Jane Goodall or any of our great heroes. Fire Nation, we all experience blockage, period. And again, those four are diction, judgment, aspiration resistance, and looping. And we are going to talk about how to free up that blockage when we get back from thanking our sponsor. Fire Nation, I'm here with Ian Siegel, the CEO of Zip Recruiter. And Ian, with the unemployment rates below 4%, it is critical that employers do everything they can to attract the best talent. So can you share some tips that employers need to be aware of? I think the number one thing that you as an employer need to be thoughtful about when you're writing a job description is you're not just describing what you need from the candidates you are also selling the candidate on what it's going to be like to work at your company. So don't just say, here's what I need from you. Say, here's what I need from you, but wait, here's what I'm going to provide for you in the way of an environment. We are a dog-friendly office. We're close to shops and restaurants. We promote from within. We have awesome benefits. We do happy hours every Friday night. Whatever your perk is, whatever makes you special, whatever makes your office special, those are the things that you want to put into your job description because remember, You're not just trying to tell them what you need from them. You're trying to woo them into coming to work for you. Fire Nation, I hope you were taking notes there because it's a job seekers market and job seeker expectations, they are high. And as entrepreneurs, we need to be creative and we have to consider the benefits that will set us apart from our competitors. That has to be considered. I mean, I know if I had a dog and I was looking for a job and that job touted the fact that they were dog friendly, that would be a huge Plus, and when it's time to find the right talent, Fire Nation, there's Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right skills, education, and experience, and actively invites them to apply to your job. As applications come in, Zip Recruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. It's no wonder Zip Recruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S., and this is based on Trustpilot ratings of hiring sites with over a thousand reviews. And right now, Fire Nation, you can try Zip Recruiter for free. Free. That's right, free. Just go to this exclusive web address, ziprecruiter.com slash fire. That's ziprecruiter.com slash F I R E. Ziprecruiter.com slash fire. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. So, Otter Juno, we're back. And again, right before the break, we were talking about the blockage, the addiction, the judgment, the aspiration resistance, the looping. I want to talk about how we can free up that blockage and give us one or two examples from within those four quarters you think would really be helpful for Fire Nation. Sure. Why don't you put me on the spot? Why don't you choose one of those four, you know, addiction, aspiration, resistance. In which quadrant? In the third quadrant. Six to nine. Good. Aspiration and resistance in six to nine is very interesting. So that means aspiration resistance in six to nine would be somebody who who is very caught up in getting things done, right? Very identified with, you know, meeting deadlines, being effective. And they look further along that phase to nine o'clock. And at nine o'clock, they see people who take vacations, who take Saturday and Sunday off. They see people who go to bed on time and they go, wow. 
you are so lucky or you're so smart. Wow, you really take care of yourself. I really want to do that too. I'm going to take a vacation when I've got this big project finished or I'm going to take Saturday or Sunday off, not this weekend, but the next weekend. So aspiration resistance in six to nine is somebody who is basically caught up in doing and doing and doing. They look wistfully at rest and vacation as a great thing to do later, but they're still caught up. Now, I've had clients who have described to me their five-year plan. You know, I've got this five-year plan. Right now, I'm working 80 or 100-hour weeks, but when my five-year plan is complete, I'm going to retire and just swim and play golf. Well, the truth is that aspiration resistance, it tends to feed that thing. So after five years, they're just even more in the hole of trying to get things done. And it always stays out of reach. So that's aspiration resistance at six to nine. And of course, you know, the, the way out of that is because when you're addicted at six, because everything becomes a to do, what you have to do is make meditation into another to do item or make, you know, uh, switching off your computer and phone all day on Sunday, you make that into a to-do item with a penalty, with accountability. So now you've kind of tricked the mind because you've you've created this sense of accomplishment around resting. And that's, you know, there are many practices we can develop, but the way to overcome aspiration resistance in that in that quadrant is to is to set a deadline on stopping and doing nothing. Let's talk next about addiction in the 12 to 3 quadrant. What does that look like? Addiction in the 12 to 3 quadrant. And by the way, we could talk about brain chemistry in a minute too. Addiction in the 12 to 3 quadrant has to do with the allure of bright, shiny new things. So that basically, I mean, when it becomes treatable as a kind of, as a pathological state, it's ADHD. It means that something new and initiating something new becomes addictive. And it is actually, there is a brain chemistry aspect to it. It's basically an addiction to dopamine. It means that you need more and more and more dopamine to be able to get that rush and you don't clear the dopamine. So the dopamine, the the receptor sites for dopamine become insensitive. You're secreting more and more dopamine. You know, the, 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 the drug uh, parallel to this would be the drug cocaine, you know, where, you know, what, you know, what people are like when they, get hooked on cocaine they're like you know they're manic they think they can do anything but it's like constantly looking to initiate something new so to addiction in 12 to 3 means that you get addicted to initiating and as soon as you're faced with the task of following through your energy sinks you love to initiate new things Wow. So Fire Nation, I'm just throwing out these different possibilities. Arjuna has no idea what I was about to say. He's fielding it and he's immediately turning that double play. I mean, this guy is a pro. Now, you mentioned brain chemistry. Let's dive into that. Yeah. So actually, I was very fortunate to be able to interview some of the best brain scientists in the world. You know, I talked to Andy Newberg, who's written many books. I talked talk to uh, uh, Jim Fadiman, Daniel Smackenberg, and many, many people who are really at the cutting edge of brain science. And we were able to map out what's happening in the brain. Now, bear in mind one thing that brain science is, you know, a lot of guesswork because you can't actually measure brain chemicals in real time. You can sometimes learn a bit, little bit about brain chemistry by artificially inducing certain brain chemicals and seeing what the symptoms are. And then you can extrapolate when people have those symptoms without us inducing them chemically, that they're probably having the same brain chemical experience. So 12 to three is really about the play of serotonin and dopamine. So that's that's the movement where at the beginning, right after 12, what you've got is, is a serotonin drenched brain with tiny releases of dopamine in the, um, in the presynaptic um, uh, cells. Uh, a little bit of, of d- dopamine crossing the synapse and highly sensitive receptor sites. So it means a little bit of dopamine produces a very strong experience. It's like that would be the analogous to a very, very faint melody that makes you cry. You know, uh, when you get around to uh, three o'clock, now you've got massive amounts of dopamine, but very desensitized receptor sites. So that would be like going to a rock concert, standing right in front of the speaker stack. And it's not actually, <laughs> it's not having the same emotional impact as that fine melody did. So that's the brain chemistry story from 12 to three is the play of serotonin and dopamine, where you need more and more dopamine to get the same pleasure. The movement from, in, in terms of brain chemistry, from three to six is actually a little bit different from 
for men and women because you know when men and women not only have different biology have different you know bodies they have different biology and different hormones so the way that men get things done or you could say the way that the masculine aspect of all of us gets things done is through the hormone testosterone and that means setting goals and then really just ignoring you know ignoring if you're hungry or thirsty or you know and just just blasting through obstacles to get it done and you tend to do that alone do you need help no i'm fine i'm going to do it on my own that's testosterone inspired accomplishment women on the other hand they have about a 30th as much testosterone in their bloodstream so it's more influenced by estrogen and oxytocin which means it's more about team building like i've got your back you've got mine we can do this together we trust in and so there's you know companies where there's a lot of women they tend to create much stronger bonds and a feeling of team spirit and and really you know making sure that there's no um competition or or um you know conflict on the team but either way whether it's inspired by one set of hormones or another by the time you get close to six we're talking about the brain chemical noradrenaline uh, and and other similar brain chemicals as well, which are to do with really what happens when you're faced with a deadline. When you're not sure if you're going to make the deadline, you're worried about financial restraints, time restraints, contractual agreements. Uh, it, it involves the adrenal glands, adrenaline released in the adrenals. And there's also, you know, there's a fair amount of fear involved when, when you're up against it to meet a deadline. So what happens when you get close to six is there is a dominance of the sympathetic nervous system and a suppression of the parasympathetic nervous system, which means that it's all of the body chemistry and brain chemistry to get things done. And you repress emotional and physical needs and symptoms. As you cross over from uh, uh, through six, we get a phenomenon known as parasympathetic flooding, which means suddenly, once you've got the job done, suddenly, you, for the first time you notice your back's aching, you haven't been to the bathroom for three hours, you really need to pee, you know, your mouth is dry, your eyes are itchy. You didn't notice all that when you were getting the job done. Now, suddenly, you notice. You also notice feelings of remorse and regret that you were harsh with people, you were harsh with yourself, you didn't see your kids for a week because you were so busy meeting the deadline. So you feel all these kind of symptoms emotionally and physically of things you'd push to the side. That's parasympathetic flooding. So as the parasympathetic nervous system, as it increases in dominance between six and nine, that moves us towards the brain chemical GABA. So by the time you get around to nine, we can see symptoms of a GABA-drenched brain. And that means when, you're, when you've got a lot of GABA in your brain, you feel it's okay, I can rest, I did my best, I may not be perfect, but there's no need to worry, things are going to be okay. You feel safe. Those are the symptoms associated with, with, with increased GABA. When the brain is drenched in GABA, it is allowed to heal itself. And what it does when it can heal itself is it produces serotonin. So then we go back to 12 again. Wow, Fire Nation, i just going to say this. Everything that we've been talking about during this entire audio masterclass is covered in more depth with amazing stories and examples and radical brilliance. In fact, I told Arjuna before we started the interview that I was running along my path here that many of you have heard me talk about right here going up to Submarine Hill in Puerto Rico. And one of the stories actually literally made me laugh out loud. And I, I frankly don't laugh out loud very often when I'm running and sweating my little booty off here in Puerto Rico on like a 87% humidity day, but it did. So he mixes in a lot of great stories, a lot of fun examples, and the there's just a lot of reasons why Fire Nation, you need to either read this book or listen to the audio version of this book, which again is read by Otter Juna, who as you can tell has a great enthusiasm and personality for what he does. But if you could just give us one main reason right now, Otter Juna, if you could just break it down for Fire Nation into one lump reason why we have to read this book, what is it? Sure. There's no ambiguity about that. You know? <laughs> like it's absolutely clear. So, Take a moment to contemplate this moment in human history. You know, we're, we're talking in uh, September 2018, but you know, this, this phase of human history, there are unresolved crisis proportion problems everywhere you look. Financially, environmentally, it doesn't matter which political party you subscribe to, whichever way it is, you can see that there are ways we are living which are simply unsustainable. Just take the national debt, for example. That can't go on like that forever. Something's going to break. Uh, you, we could, we could, I could, I, you, you know the list. We could just go on all day with our reliance on fossil fuels cannot go on forever. So 
what is it, what's needed today? What is most needed? What does your heart call for today? You know, imagine that we were on the Titanic and you can, you're lucky enough to be able to see the iceberg in the distance. You're not going to go and gamble and try and make money at the tables. You're not going to enjoy a nice dinner. If you can see the iceberg and see there's still the possibility to avert the direction of the boat, you're going to do something. And really to be awake today, to be a man or a woman of conscience, to be a really a great human being, a brilliant human being means you recognize the urgency to contribute. Many people can't do that. Many people, they don't have the money. They don't have the for, they don't have the opportunity to make much of a difference. But who is going to make a difference today? If we're going to turn the ship around and if we're going to have a sustainable, joyful future for our children and our grandchildren and our grandchildren of our grandchildren, if they're going to live in a world that is as good as it could be, who is going to turn that around? Personally, I've given up on government. I don't think either any political party is going to actually solve this for us. There's too much bickering, too much partisanship and opposition. One thing I really believe too is there's too much short-term thinking. I mean, they exactly. are such short-term thinkers and that's not what's going to win. That's all they care about. I've given up on religion. You know, I mean, religion is great if you're into it, but I don't think religion is going to solve any of this stuff. No. I've given up on nonprofit organizations. They're too usually too tied up in red tape and board meetings and blah, blah, blah. You know who I think and I'm sure of this, you know uh, who I think can turn all this around, and I actually believe will turn this Who's around, that? is young entrepreneurs. Yes. Young entrepreneurs are the hope for the future because young entrepreneurs, you see, entrepreneurship has changed, in my opinion. I'm sure you know more about this than I do. I don't believe that young entrepreneurs, I don't believe mostly that they're primarily inspired by profit anymore. I think they're inspired by contribution. It's what I would call an evolutionary entrepreneur. You're motivated by being a servant of evolution. And yes, you need to make money, but your primary motivation is to get out of bed in the morning and make the greatest difference you can make. That means to be brilliant. And that, to answer your question, that to me is the compelling driving reason to give yourself to a brilliant life. Not so much for you, but so that you can at least know that you gave everything you could possibly give to the well-being of as many people as possible. And that, dear friends, without a doubt, I would say, is the guaranteed key to a good life, to a satisfying life, to a well-lived life, to a life where one day you can breathe your last breath with a sigh of gratitude and satisfaction. And that's where all the prizes are. And, you know, I, in the book, I'm sure, I don't know if you got to the part about Lynn Twist, but Lynn Twist has devoted her life to alleviating poverty in the world, to saving the Amazon rainforest. She's the most fulfilled person I know. So that's the key. You know, why would we want to busy ourselves with all this so that you can become the very best version of yourself and make the greatest contribution possible? And lo and behold, money will take care of itself. Good relationships will take care of themselves. You'll have health. You'll have energy because when you devote yourself to a life of brilliance and contribution, everything is given to you. I can say without a shadow of a doubt that I truly believe from everything that I've experienced now, interviewing over 2,000 successful entrepreneurs and just hearing from thousands upon thousands of Fire Nation around the world, is that every single human being is just innately striving and wants that real sense of their giving back, that real sense that they are contributing to this world. And what I love about what you said about the young entrepreneurs is they are the generation that sees it so clearly that they can make it happen because they see other people doing it. They're coming up in that generation. They realize that with the internet, with their phone, with just commitment to that sense of um, committing and giving back that they can do exactly what you're talking about to make this huge impact in this world. So I'm loving all of that. And Arjuna, there's a lot of places that we can pick up radical brilliance. Is there any place in particular that you really want to drive Fire Nation to go? I mean, you can certainly get it on Amazon. That's simple because you've got a choice of Kindle, paperback or um, Audible. You can get it in bookstores. You know, this is a, a book that we published but some bookstores stock it. Sometimes you may have to ask them to order it and they'll have it in a few days. You can also go to our website, radicalbrilliance.com. Uh, and without spending a penny, I'll guide you through everything we've talked about today in more detail. I'll give you a bunch of gifts, you know, a bunch of downloads of audio and video and uh, interviews with people. I've got a very rich 
array of gifts for you that will cost you nothing and that will give you a much deeper insight into the brilliant cycle. Incidentally, let me just give one little edit. Sure. We talked about young entrepreneurs. Let's call that young at heart. You I like know, that. I, That's a good edit. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, Barbara Marks Hubbard would totally fit into right. what we're talking about. She's 87 now, I think 88. I and she's the one of the youngest people I know. I love that edit. Could not agree with it more in Fire Nation. You know this. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So hang out with those people that are young at heart. And by the way, today, you've been hanging out with AA and JLD. So keep up the the heat. And of course, head directly over to radicalbrilliance.com. There's a lot of goodies there. The book is available on Amazon and any place you want to get it. Again, I really, really have been enjoying the audio version of this and you're listening to Podcast Fire Nation. So I know you love the audio version of things as well. So check out Audible too. And Arjuna, thank you for sharing your truth today with Fire Nation. For that, we salute you and we'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, Fire Nation, today's value bomb content was brought to you by Arjuna Auditor. And if you are ready to discover your big idea in just, well, less than an hour, actually, um, check out the free and amazing system that I've created for you where you can do just that. It's at yourbigidea.io. It is free. Get over there. I'll catch you there, Fire Nation. And I will catch you also on the flip side. If you're looking to hire, then I've got great news. ZipRecruiter doesn't wait for quality candidates to find you. It finds them for you. ZipRecruiter's powerful technology scans thousands of resumes to identify people with the right skills and experience and then actively invites them to apply to your job. That means you get quality candidates fast. And right now you can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash fire. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash fire. ZipRecruiter. Once again, the smartest way to hire.